I think we're recording live at the Log House Church. This is part two of the study, My Sheep. And the first part, we laid the foundation for the study from John chapter 6. And when you go and you read John chapter 6 in the Bible, something, something should jump out at us as we read that. And here's the, here's the lesson that we should learn from John 6, that the majority of the people that call themselves disciples were never believers to start with. Now when we read John chapter 6, there was a vast amount of people that decided in and of themselves to start following Jesus. They at some point made a decision, I'm going to follow Jesus. But John chapter 6 and Jesus himself shows that they were following him for the wrong reason. Jesus himself said, you followed me not because you believe, but because you saw the miracles and you were filled with food. So you could say that the vast majority of people that were called disciples in John chapter 6 were in it for some kind of experience, but they were never born again. Now what happened in John 6 is Jesus started making some truth claims and some statements, and when Jesus said this, it, the result was they asked the question, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? So they did not endure the truth of what Jesus was saying, those that were truly not born again. And there were at least hundreds or if not thousands of people that were following Jesus. So we can say that we can safely say that there were probably 5,000 people that were following Jesus. Because earlier in John 6, Jesus said, make the men sit down, and he fed over 5,000. So we can say that there were 5,000 some odd people following Jesus everywhere he went. But at the end of chapter 6 of John, there are only 11 left. Out of the thousands there is just a very small majority that are left. Everybody else went away, proving that they were never a true disciple or a true sheep, if you will, to start with. Now, the ones that were left, interestingly, are the original ones that were chosen and called by Jesus. That's the only ones that were left. So those that are called and chosen will endure. And you know, you that are sitting here today are a testimony of endurance. I look at Judith back here and our brother, and you all have been here for years at this congregation. You've seen people go, you've seen people leave, You've seen shouting, you've been through the hard times, you've been through the good times, and here you are still here. That is not a coincidence that you have endured. You've remained steady through it all. That's one of the characteristics of somebody that's truly been born again. It's what's called perseverance. Perseverance is stick to that means you don't give up at every little thing that comes and goes. Now these, the vast majority, if John 6 teaches us anything, it teaches us that the vast majority of people that profess to be followers of Christ never were converted or were true believers to start with. Now, if you do the math of John chapter 6, if you divide 5,000 into 11, 
you get .002%. So that's how many people out of the crowd in John 6 were truly believers. Now, that's true in John 6, and it's true in the world today. We may not want to accept it, folks, but just a few percentage of people will ever be saved. The facts show, and I did an average, that the numbers were 97%, 94%, and 75%. If you do the average of that, that's 0.001%. Of the people that profess to have been saved, uh, when they look at their lives a year later, five years later, ten years later, there never was evidence of a changed heart. Therefore, they were not truly converted. Because one of the evidences of someone that's truly saved is what Jesus called fruits. By their fruits ye shall know them. And there is the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22 and folks, it's as plain as this. If you do not exhibit the fruit of the Spirit sometime in your life, you are not born again. That's evidence that the Holy Spirit does not reside within you. And if you do not have the Holy Spirit indwelling, the Bible says you are not of His. So the fact is that the majority of the people in John Six were not saved and the majority of professing people today are not saved as well. These people that were following Jesus made a conscious decision in and of themselves to start following Jesus. And it's the same today. Most people are lost because they made some kind of decision to start following Jesus, but there never was any conviction from the Holy Spirit in their heart to start with. Without conviction, there is no conversion. So it's the same today as it was back then. The vast majority of people are deciding at some point, I want to follow Jesus, but they're ne they never have experienced true conversion. That's what John 6 tells us. Now, let's go to John chapter 10 and let's look at the characteristics of a true sheep. As we said before, and we'll say it again, Christendom, that's the entire that's the entire group of people that are true Christians and people that are professing Christians. We call that Christendom. And in the entire Christendom, there are two groups of people that are in Christendom. There are saved people and there are lost people. And it's always been that way. It was that way in John 6. And it's that way now, today in 2018. Uh, you remember Jesus told the parable of the wheat and the tares? The tares look just like the wheat. And you can tell no difference in them. Matter of fact, in the, in the, uh, in the parable... There, there was a response to Jesus that said, let's just tear them all up and throw them all away. That way we'll get rid of the tares. So that is evidence that they, you could not distinguish a tear from other wheat in the parable. That there are people that look like, act like, dress like Christians, but in their hearts they've never experienced true conversion. And it's not the minority, it's the majority that are that way. That's why this study is so important. We need to know whether or not we are a true sheep of Christ. There are some characteristics that should be 
in a true sheep of Christ that are not in only a professing Christian. So that way we can examine ourselves in the uh, in the gospel message there is what we call the universal call and that would be found in Mark 16 15 Jesus said go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature now the man of God is commanded to preach the gospel to everyone but at the same time the preacher of God is commanded to preach the gospel to everyone, but any Bible preacher will know that not everyone will properly respond to the gospel message. So at the same time he's preaching the gospel, he's not expecting everyone to be saved. I'll tell you this, if you're a young preacher and you're starting out preaching, and if you preach the gospel and it's your expectation that every time you preach the gospel that everybody in the room that's lost is going to come and be saved, you're headed for disappointment. I'll tell you that right now. Because there is the universal call and then there is the effectual call. That's why the Bible says many are called but few are chosen. So we're going to talk about what it means to be a true sheep. Actually, the word church, one of the names of the church is the called out ones. Those that are called according to His purpose. So let's go to John 10 and let's look real quickly at some things that are, that are true of a sheep. Number one, Jesus is qualified to be the shepherd. There it is. I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold. So Jesus is the door. He's the only one that's qualified to be the shepherd of the sheep. Nobody else is. Not the leader of Buddhism, not the leader of Hinduism, only the leader of Christianity is qualified to lead the sheep, and that's Jesus Christ. Verse 3, the sheep, look what it says, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. So the shepherd calls out every one of his sheep by name. When you, in your conversion experience, when you were drawn by the Holy Spirit, that was actually Jesus the Shepherd calling you by name to come into His fold. Have you ever thought about it that way? Your calling? Think about your salvation as a calling from the Shepherd. So first of all, sheep are called by the Shepherd by name. That means it's a personal thing. Your salvation experience is personal. It was personal with Paul. The heavens opened up and Jesus from heaven actually spoke to Paul. And salvation is a personal experience. Notice in verse 3, and leadeth them out, the, the second thing characteristic of a sheep is they are led, they are not driven or prodded or coerced. If you try to drive a sheep, you know what they'll do? They'll scatter. But if you lead sheep, they'll follow where you go. That is true naturally speaking and that is true spiritually speaking. So by design, sheep follow they are not driven that's important because probably all of us in here 
have experienced pastors trying to drive the sheep or they're always shearing the sheep and if you drive sheep they're going to go away from you they're not going to hang with you so they're designed to be led by the shepherd so they are called by name and they are led verse 4 and 5 the sheep follow him and look at what what it says in verse 5 and a stranger will they not follow So a true sheep of Christ, there is no doubt about whether or not the sheep will follow Christ. The reason I say that is there are are doctrines out there that says, well, if you're truly born again, you may follow Christ today and you may follow the devil the next day. You may follow the flesh the day after that. That's not what Jesus says. I will say this, that if someone says they are truly saved, but they never follow Jesus, they never read the Bible, they are not a true sheep of Christ. True sheep of Christ positively follow Christ. And Jesus said another, they will not follow. He said they, he didn't say they might not follow or they may not follow. He said they will not So a true sheep of Christ, there is no doubt that they will follow Christ. Now there may be times that they wander, but in the totality of their life, they will follow Jesus. There there are sins that doth so easily beset true sheep. So we may for a time wander, but the great shepherd goes and gets his true sheep and brings them back to the flock. That's what he does. So there's no doubt as to whether the sheep will follow Christ. They may or may not. Because it's in a sheep's nature to follow their shepherd. It happens naturally. In other words, if you're truly born again, you don't have to work up some kind of spiritual experience. You don't have to pull in the parking lot and say, oh, it's time to be a Christian now. I better work it up before I get there. I've lived for myself all week. I've lived for the world. I've lived for the flesh. I've lived for the devil. Now that I'm pulling in the church parking lot, it's time to start thinking like a Christian. It doesn't work that way with true sheep. If you are a true sheep, you or a true Christian, or a true believer, you are that way 24-7. You are not just that way one day a week or a couple of hours out of the week. But unfortunately, folks, for the vast majority that profess to be saved, that's the way it is. They largely live for themselves all through the week, and they give the Lord a couple of hours a week on Sunday. That's not characteristic of a true sheep. Jesus said they would not follow another. Now, verse 27, here is another thing a sheep will do. Look at what verse 27 says. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So a The true sheep will hear the shepherd's call. If you remember, all during Jesus' ministry, when he was preaching, what would he say? He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus understood that when he preached the gospel, that not everyone would respond to it. If you follow the gospel messages in the Bible from Jesus and Paul, in each and every case, there were some that believed and there were others that didn't believe. There were some that accepted Christ and Paul. There were others that got mad enough at them to kill them. So that's the response to the gospel. 
the same sun or gospel that softens wax hardens clay. So the gospel, the Bible actually says the gospel is an offense to those that know not Christ or foolishness. The cross is an offense. If you preach the gospel, it will offend the lost, but the true sheep, it will be rejoicing to them. So that's the difference. Every sheep of the shepherd will hear the shepherd's call. It's not like they'll hear it and say, well, I don't think I want to hear the shepherd right now. When the sheep hears the shepherd's voice, they immediately are in tune with that voice and they immediately are drawn to it and they immediately want to be where that voice is. There's no such thing as a sheep hearing the shepherd's voice and saying, I don't believe I want to follow the shepherd right now. No, Jesus said they will hear his voice. So if you hear the voice of your shepherd, you are a true sheep. If you are interested in hearing and you love hearing your Savior, your shepherd speak to you, you are a true sheep. If you love God's word and that's how he's spoken to us. That's verse 27. A couple more things about a true sheep and in verses 28 and 29 and verses 11 and 15. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. For my Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So true sheep will be saved or delivered. They will persevere. Not because of themselves, but because of the great shepherd that they are following. If you ask any Christian that is truly not saved to give an explanation of why they expect to be in heaven one day, if you ask the question to professing Christians that are not true sheep, if you make it to heaven one day, What's the reason going to be that you made it there? Every answer from, a, from someone that's truly not saved will be, will have I in the answer. Because I did this, or because I did that, or because I did not do this. Ask a true sheep the same question. You know what the answer is going to be? I'm going to be in heaven one day because of Jesus Christ. The glory goes to the great shepherd. The sheep, a true sheep of the shepherd will give all the glory to the shepherd. Naturally speaking, if you, if you made the requirement of a sheep getting from one field, a herd of sheep, to another field, if you left it up to the sheep themselves to get there, from point A to point B, what do you think would happen? They would, they would probably stay there until they died or they would all wander off one by one until nothing was left. But you put a shepherd with the sheep that the sheep knows that shepherd, those sheep are going to make it to their destination. Not because of the sheep, but because of the shepherd. That's naturally speaking and spiritually speaking. But there are doctrines in Christianity that places the responsibility of the saved getting from earth to heaven in, the, in man's lap. And it gives the glory to man instead of God and Christ. So true sheep will persevere because of the shepherd. And the sheep understand that. The shepherd 
has the right to be the shepherd of the sheep. Why? Because he gave his life for the sheep. Verses 11 and 15, look what it says. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Verse 15, as the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So if you're truly born again, truly saved, a true sheep, you realize beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus gave His life for you. Under the Mosaic law, the sheep died for the shepherd. But under the law of grace, the shepherd died died for the sheep. The first time the Mosaic Law was proclaimed in the Old Testament, 3,000 people died. The first time the Gospel was preached after the church became visible at Pentecost, 3,000 people were saved. Wow! That's the difference in being a true sheep. Now, Now, verse 14 and verse 27, this is true of the sheep, that the shepherd knows and is known by the sheep. Verse 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Verse 14 says, I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. That lets us know that true sheep are have an intimate relationship with the shepherd. An intimate personal relationship. Now how does that how does that uh, play out in our lives? Well, many that profess to be saved or truly born again have no desire to read God's word. They have no desire to pray. They have no desire to be with God's people. And yet they profess to be saved. But they're not interested in having an intimate relationship with Christ. Now when bad things happen, those that profess to be saved, suddenly they're interested in people praying for them. But all the rest of the time they could care less about Christ, God, the church, or anything but the true sheep of Christ they have an intimate ongoing personal relationship with Jesus Christ now how does that look in the life of the true believer that means we have a desire to read God's Word that means we have a desire to pray that means we have a desire to be with God's people. And, and by the way, it doesn't have to be worked up. We naturally have a desire to do these things because Jesus is our shepherd. Those that don't have this desire are professing Christians, but they're not true sheep. That's what Jesus said. That he, they, he is known of them and they are known of Him. There's that intimate relationship. Now, here's a question. Do you have an intimate relationship with Jesus? The vast majority of people that profess to be Christians or saved, if they would be honest, they would say no to that answer. But we need to be able to say yes to that. Now let's look at a couple of more things. Let's go to verse 26. And let's see what it says. But ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep. Now Jesus is telling the... uh, 99.999% of people here, He's telling them they are not believers. 
And in a, in a previous scripture in John 6, Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus knew who they were that believed not and who should betray him. So Judas was in the crowd of unbelievers. Jesus said, You believe not because you are not my sheep. Only true sheep believe the gospel. So if you have repented and believed the gospel, you are one of Jesus' true sheep. The fact of the matter is that most people that profess to be saved or not, I cannot emphasize that more. There cannot, and sadly and ironic, in the age that we live in, folks, the thing that needs to be stressed the most is stressed absolutely the least. We need to be begging people, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith, but people literally get mad at you if you start wanting to ask people to examine themselves. The fact of the matter is that the average preacher and pastor in America, when when one of their church members starts wondering whether they're truly saved or not, that preacher will take them back to an experience or a decision that they made years ago, and they will ask them to have faith in that experience and that decision. Never mind that the that your life from the day of your profession has been nothing but the life of an unbeliever. Your fruits have not shown. Never mind that. Just trust a decision that you made and that's good enough. And I get so frustrated when I see this in Christianity. We know some people that are young people that the person professes to be a preacher, he's a young, just a young fella, but he's living with his girlfriend, they're having sex, and yet they claim to be a preacher. Folks, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. True sheep will have true fruits. Without fruits, there is not true conversion. Without conviction, there's not true conversion. But the problem is that people are getting lost people to trust in a decision that they made at some point instead of repenting and believing the gospel. That's where the problem comes in. So only true sheep believe the gospel and true sheep will persevere not by their own will or might but because of the shepherd. They are protected and they are preserved. The great shepherd is the one that protects and preserves the sheep. We are preserved from the wrath of God and we're preserved to the glories that awaits us. So if you're truly born again and you're truly saved, you are saved from some things and you are saved to some things. Did you know that if you are lost right now and if you're listening to this, you are right now under the wrath of God. The Bible said the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. Romans chapter 1. So if you're lost, you're not going to be in the future under the wrath of God. You are right now under the wrath of God. But if you're truly saved and you're a true sheep, we've been saved from the wrath of God not through the wrath of God, as some teach. So praise the Lord. If you are truly born again, we have so much to rejoice about. We've been saved from some things and to some things.
praise the Lord. But it's not true of those that are not a true sheep. The requirement to be saved from the wrath of God is that you have to be truly born again. You have to be truly born again. Now, I will, I will end with this. The statistics show, if you look at those three numbers I gave you earlier, that averages out to 88.6% of people will never be saved. That plays out today in reality with statistics. And if we go to the Bible, we find the same holds true in God's Word. In Noah's day, eight out of the entire population of the earth were saved. That's in the book of Galatians. No, I'm sorry, book of Peter. There were eight souls were saved by water. In Lot's day, a conservative estimation, that means a low number estimation of the population of Sodom and Gomorrah was 4,000. There were four people out of 4,000 that were saved during that time. Now here's what's interesting. Here's where it gets interesting. Jesus said it would be in the last days right before he came back like it was in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot. So one of the characteristics of right before Jesus come back is that the majority of people are not going to be saved. John 6 holds that to be true. The, the illustration of Lot and Noah, if we look at that evidence in the Scripture, it shows the fact of the, ma the matter is just a few people will truly be saved or truly be true sheep of Christ. Now, we can coerce, convince, or intimidate people into making a profession. But a profession is not necessarily possession of salvation. A profession of salvation is not necessarily a possession of salvation. In, in the prisons, everybody wants to be saved. But also, everybody's innocent if you speak to them in the prisons also. So, take that for what it's worth. Everybody wants to be saved, they feel a sense of guilt and remorse, but they're, everybody's innocent also. <laughs> and that's the way it is with humanity. We all like to think, well, we're pretty good. We're getting better. But you know what? We're still lost. And we need to be saved. So we can coerce, convince, or intimidate someone to make a decision but there will never be a conversion without God first doing a work in the heart at the same time. The problem is that we've left God and the Holy Spirit out of it now. We're trying to get people to make commitments for Christ, decisions for Christ, without telling them how sorry they are how wretched they are, how lost they are, how hell-deserving they are. We're wanting to bypass that and just go to the good part and leave the bad part out. But do, part of the gospel is the bad part. The bad part is we're hell-deserving, wretched, lost sinners deserving of hell. The good part is you don't have to go there. That's the good part. But we're leaving the bad part out. And the result is our buildings are being filled with false converts or tares, if you will. So it's very, it's very, this study is very important in our day and age. It's very important that we get people to think about whether they're truly saved or not, whether they are true sheep. Do these things we talked about exist in your life naturally 
If they don't, please consider whether or not you've truly been born again. So we'll end there. Tell everybody about these studies they are at YouTube.